colloquium. Today we have the pleasure of having Nathan Berkovitz here from the IFT. And he's going to talk about challenges of quantizing gravity, a personal view. So thanks, George, for, for the invitation. Um, so the title is George. The part I like is a personal view. The other part I'll say a little bit about, but I'm certainly not an expert about all different aspects of quantum gravity. And I'll use the board. So if people want to move closer, it might be a good idea. Um, so I, of course, work in string theory. So most of the talk will be about what I know about. I'm not knowledgeable about the other aspects. But, but I'll say at least what are the problems with quantum gravity and why I work in string theory. And although I will, I don't discourage people to work in other fields, but uh, certainly my choice is because I prefer, uh, I'll give the reasons why I prefer string theory. So, um, so why do we need to work hard in order to quantize gravity? So um, we can start um, by just reviewing um, why gravity is more difficult to quantize than field theory, at least the field theories we're used to, which is the standard model field theories. So in QCD, or in uh, quantum, I guess in, uh, better saying, Yang-Mills, because without quarks, the usual action you write down is, let, so let's talk in four dimensions, although the story changes if you go to different dimensions. But at least in four dimensions, uh, the standard model is a renormalizable theory. So. So you don't have to know field theory in order to follow the talk. But um, so if f is um, so you can put the coupling constant in front, and if you want, you can rescale the coupling constant by defining a prime. to be equal to, I guess, 1 over g am. And then this can be written as something which looks like a perturbative action. So you start with a term and then you get a coupling term, which is something like g And then there's a quartic term that I'm not going to worry about. But because it, you can perturb around um, the number of fields, of course, you can compute scattering amplitudes. And the important thing I want to stress is that this coupling constant doesn't carry dimension. So that's in four dimensions. So in other dimensions, it will carry dimension. But in four dimensions, uh, Yang-Mills is called renormalizable essentially because the coupling constant doesn't carry dimension. So if you compute, for example, a three-point scattering, then you get a tree-level scattering. And of course, there's a factor of g here because of this g here. But you also get a factor of momentum. Right? So I'm not going to try to contract the indices, but you can see this proportional to the momentum. If you compute a one-loop, so of course, there are different ways to draw the one loop, but um, they all have the same counting. So you get a factor of k at each vertex because of the momentum here. You get, of course, three factors of g. And you also have uh, propagators. So the propagators in four dimensions always go like 1 over k squared, actually, in any dimension. So. And you have an integral over the momentum. So you have something like d4k, where k is the k circling in the loops. And then you have 1 over k squared to the cubed. And then you have 3k's coming out. So it's easy to see this goes also like, if I did the counting right, oh, sorry, k cubed. It goes like k again. So the, the tree amplitude goes like g times k. And the one loop goes like 
g cubed times k. And of course, it's related to the fact that g doesn't carry dimensions. Okay. So what that means is, of course, you have to put in a cutoff here in order because you get divergences. But you always know that it's the, the behavior is going to go like the log of the cutoff, okay? just because there's no, there's no scale dependence here. Okay. So that's ordinary Yang-Mills or electromagnetism or anything in four dimensions. Now I can do the same thing with gravity. So there you put in Newton's constant. And again, in four dimensions, it turns out the Newton constant carries dimension. So that's easy to see. So this is the, the Hilbert action for gravity. So R is built out of the metric. So you don't have to know precisely what it is, but it carries two derivatives and lots of Gs. So this is, OK, I'm not going to, OK, you can write it in some nonlinear form. I'm not going to try to do that. And here I'm expanding around G small or G Minkowski. Okay. Okay, so we can do the same trick as we did before. We expand by rescaling. So sorry, I use G twice. This is the metric. Okay, everybody uses G for the metric. Here it was a coupling constant. Okay, so what is convenient to do, you don't just rescale because usually what you do is you write GMN is equal to HMN or 8MN. And then you put a factor of square root of g times hmn. So hmn you can think of as the fluctuation around flat space, just like this a prime, I guess I should have put a primes here, is the fluctuation around a small. Okay. So in any theory, if you want to do perturbation, you have to choose a background. Okay. So perturbation theory, by definition, is background dependent. So we'll come back to that point later. OK, but I can expand now around h. And you find something similar. It's d4x, dh, dh. Then you get a factor of square root of g. And then the difference with uh, Yang-Mills or electromagnetism is instead of having one derivative here, you have two derivatives here. And that's, of course, because g carries units. So it's easy to see that G carries units of, um, I guess it's going to carry units. I can tell it from here. H doesn't carry units. So G must carry, uh, sorry, H carries units. G carries units of 1 over length squared, or length squared, sorry. G carries units of length. So this carries units of length to the fourth. This carries units of length to the minus 2, so this must carry units of length squared. Okay. So different from small g, which doesn't carry any unit. Okay. So again, we can do it higher order if we want. We can do the same kind of expansion as we had here. I don't have to redo the diagrams. Now you're going to get a k squared, right? So you're going to get k squared here. Here it's going to be replaced by square root of g. Here, you're still going to get the 1 over k squared, but now you're going to get k squareds, k squareds, k squareds here. So instead of being k cubed here, it's going to be k to the sixth. Right? So now what you find is this goes like k to the fourth, whereas this one goes like k squared. So it's kind of obvious. It's because square root of g carries dimension. So here you get a square root of g cubed. So you find that, um, that as you go to higher and higher, higher order loop order, you get more and more divergence coming from the high energy part of the integral. Okay? So this diverges not like log lambda, but it's going to diverge like something like um, lambda squared, something like that, if lambda carries units of, of energy. So that's why one says gravity in four dimensions is non-renormalizable. Okay. In two dimensions, gravity would be actually um, quantizable because in two dimensions, square root of G, capital G, would not carry units. Okay. So the, the, the things are dimension dependent, but once you go above, um, once you go above three dimensions, 
gravity is no longer renormalizable here. OK, any questions? GMN, um, no, so all of these terms have the same dimension, so G has no dimensions, small g. Okay, so um, there are different things you can do, of course. You can say, okay, perturbation theory doesn't make sense. Okay, so how to, I mean, there are different approaches. So this is, nobody disagrees with this point, okay? So there are different approaches. One approach is, Avoid perturbation theory, right? If you want to say ignore perturbation theory, if you want to say it's the same thing, so. So how do you do that? Well, it might be that perturbation around flat space is not the right thing to do. You're supposed to, there's some, maybe there's some non-trivial fixed point of the theory. So one approach is to say something like asymptotic that you pretend, because nobody can do the computation, that there's some non-trivial fixed point on which I can perturb around. And we, we say gravity is, is perfectly well-defined, it's just it's not well-defined near flat space, or not well-defined near in this kind of expansion. Um, there certainly exist uh, some theories in which you can uh, find non-trivial critical points, but I don't think there's any examples in which you can actually do computations if you don't even know what the non-trivial critical point is. So to me, this is you know um, jumping into a void and saying, you know, I'm going to ignore, I'm, I'm going, well, again, there are people who work on this. So I'm just saying that for me, it's, um, it's, it's very difficult to get information about the theory if you don't know what the non-trivial critical point looks like. So people try. Uh, <coughs> Nita, just a question. So in this case, in this interrupt, but you don't have to raise your hand. Okay. In this approach, people assume that the problem is perturbing around Minkowski space-time, and that's some uh, that. That's right. So they agree there's a problem. Nobody disagrees this is not a problem. Okay. But there might be a non-trivial critical point of the theory. So there might be a value of capital G. So of course, here I'm when I say per perturbation theory, I'm treating square root of capital G as small. Otherwise, it's not, I'm not allowed to do perturbation theory. They say, well, no, square root to G might be capital G. Might, there might be some value of square root to capital G in which the perturbation theory makes sense. So I can't, I can't check it by doing square root of G small because I have to know what the theory looks like near square root of G large. So there might be some non-trivial fixed point of the theory, which is that the, the beta function vanishes. But... Um, Essentially, I don't have any information about it, so I'm going to try to construct a theory which has a non-trivial fixed point and say, well, this has something to do with gravity. Um, so, for example, they don't start with R. I, I mean, again, I'm not the right person to ask about other approaches to quantum gravity. But they modify this in some way, and they say, okay, this is what the, this is what the theory looks like near the non-trivial fixed point. Yeah. It's certainly a non -zots. So there's no, there's no evidence that I know for this action having a non-trivial fixed point. So, of course, so everybody believes that G runs. People believe it runs too fast, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, nobody believes it has a fixed point here. Okay. Um, but there might be some fixed points someplace else. So there certainly are some theories which have non-trivial fixed points. But in order to find these non-trivial fixed points, you usually have to do perturbation theory around flat or some small coupling and then find this non-trivial fixed point. It's very difficult to just say, just start with that ansatz. But OK, there's a group of people doing that, and they might be right. Maybe there is a non-trivial fixed point, but um, it's hard to get there. OK, another way to deal with the theory is saying, OK, quantum gravity is something we don't understand but I can treat it as an effective action. So we say, OK, obviously, if you put in a cutoff, the divergences go away. But the theory depends on the cutoff. Okay. Now, for me, my point of view, quantum gravity, as we'll get to, um, is a theory which the zero experimental evidence for it at the moment. 
but there's lots of theoretical reasons to believe that it exists. Um, effective actions are useful in the opposite case, where there's lots of experiments to tell you what the effective theory looks like, but you don't really understand the theory. Okay, so effective action is just put in every term you can, which obeys the symmetries, and see and fit the co fit the coefficients to match the experiment. So of course you can do it; no, nothing stops you from doing it. But it, for me, it's a useless exercise because there's no experiment to compare with, so there's nothing to fix. Um, so of course um, you can you can you can do the theoretical computation and say, look. If I had an experiment, then I can fix this coefficient. If I had another experiment, I could fix this coefficient. That's fine, but until you have the experiments, it's kind of an exercise. Yeah, conceptually, for me, it's 100% correct. There's nothing wrong with the concept, but as usefulness, I find, um, well, it's an exercise. Um, but until you have an experiment that you can use to fix the coefficient, you don't know if your effective action is correct or not. So you can write down all possible terms. You can put coefficients in terms of every term, but you don't know until you have an experiment to tell you which terms the coefficient is relevant or not. So, um, OK, but again, there are groups of people working on it. Um, so that's another approach. Uh, no, of course. I don't, I don't, I, no, no, but the word effective. I think it's crucial they have experiments in order to talk about effective actions. Yeah, 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 for any theory. But no, but sorry. Effective action means you ignore the high energy degrees of freedom, okay? So the hope is, and I'll get to that later, at least in string theory or in any theory of quantum gravity from my point of perspective, is that if you understand the, the high energy degrees of freedom, you'll eventually get information which will be useful, okay? So effective action essentially says, no, I don't care about the high energy degrees of freedom. I'm going to use experiments to fix the low energy degrees of freedom, which is fine if you have experiments to fix them. So QCD, you know very well. Um, OK, so that's, uh, there's another uh, approach, which is um, not too different from string theory, but trying to modify this and put in higher derivative terms. So I told you that we started with the kinetic term being dh dh, which tells you that the propagator is 1 over k squared, essentially 1 over the number of derivatives here. Suppose it started with d squared h, d squared h. That gives you a different, that gives you 1 over k to the fourth. In that theory, it turns out the theory is renormalizable because you always get the cancellations. So that, of course, will modify the, the dimension of g. So that's called higher derivative gravity, or if it has two derivatives in four dimensions, it's called conformal gravity. So start with it. Well, it depends on, if you don't start with it, then it doesn't help. I agree with you. <laughs> that doesn't stop people from treating general relativity as a perturbation of this, for example. You start with this, and then you say general relativity is somehow some perturbation of this. Some people try. Conformal gravity is an interesting theory to study by itself. Maybe you can understand Einstein gravity as a um, special case. So it's where the coupling constant is dimensionless. So it starts d squared h, d squared h. You can add, you can add interaction terms. So it depends on what dimension, but it's something like r squared instead of... That's right. Yeah, okay, so it's, uh, when I write R, I didn't write the indices, but. So it's an interesting theory to study. Does it have anything to do with general duty? Maybe. Maybe you put, some people try to put in boundary conditions, which somehow the boundary condition gets rid of the, so the problem with conformal gravity is, of course, it has lots of unphysical stuff. So it doesn't describe a spin two particle. But you can say, no, it describes lots of junk together with Newtonian gravity. It has a spin two particle, but it has junk with it. So of course, d fourth h equals zero has a solution which is d squared h equals zero. So it contains solutions with d squared h equals zero, but it contains lots of other junk which you don't want, which is non-unitary, blah, blah, blah. No. Well, I don't know how you define unitary, but 
if it has negative, if it has fields of negative probability, it's not unitary. No, look, look. Okay, this is a. This seminar is for this discussion. These discussions are exactly what this seminar is for. To kill ideas which I think are wrong, because it's my personal view, right? My personal view. So the only, the only theories we know which are unitary in four dimensions are spin one, spin three halves, spin two, etc. Which particle do you think is in conformal gravity, which is... So there are lots of uh, other particles in... in no, it's conformal. It's all massless, but there's this fields of negative kinetic terms. No, 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 no R, just R squared. R squared has... If you have d squared h, d squared h... No, it's very simple. If you have d squared h, d squared h, the energy, you can't make the energy and, pos and probability both be positive. So that's why people don't use these actions. Okay. Okay, but again, you can study them. So, you can treat R squared as a deformation of R. That's okay. You can... No, 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 no. It's all... So, as I said, soon I'm going to go to string theory and then go away from these topics. So, <laughs> so R and R squared, you can start with R and deform it. That's okay. And that's a deformation which happens in, in, in many theories. Okay, but if you start with R squared, which is what you need in order to get rid of this problem, you're essentially dead. But not people study and write papers and etc. Okay, so that's one possibility. Another possibility is say, okay, we're going to change the, our definition of space time. So we're going to say space is no longer continuous. Some people even go further and say time is not continuous. Okay, so, so this is, of course, radical, not obviously wrong. So it's possible that at some length scale, space is not continuous. But essentially, everything we learn in physics, we have to throw away because you don't have Lorentz symmetry, okay? But it's curved, so, you know, maybe you don't want Lorentz symmetry. So all of physics has to be redone, which doesn't stop people from working on this. So there are different ways to do this. One way is, is something called dynamical triangulation, so causal dynamical triangulation, where you say, you know, space is made up of these different points. Um, okay, you have to reinvent special relativity, quantum mechanics, you know, and people, you can do, for example, Monte Carlo simulations and see you know, what you get. It's not uninteresting. Um, one thing they haven't been able to show, and, and I put loop quantum gravity in the same. So loop quantum gravity is kind of a mixture. You, you start with, so again, I'm not, I've, I've listened to lots of seminars and mini courses on this, but I'm certainly not an expert on this. But loop quantum gravity, what you do is you start with Einstein's action. You write it in canonical form, which means you write it, it's a gauge theory. You write it in terms of constraints and states. You find, of course, that the constraints have to be, um, um, what's the word, normal ordered. Normal ordering gives all the problems that we just saw. But then they say, okay, so let's ignore those problems for now. We're going to solve the constraints in some way. And then they start to change the definitions in the sense some fields which were real become complex. They write down a wave function. And then I kind of get lost. So they have, they have something called spin foam where they have... So up to the wave function, I understand. Of course, some of the constraints, they don't know how to normal order, but they study that, how to, how to do normal ordering. But... I'm sorry? I'm sorry, I don't know. I, so what I know about... Quantum gravity is you start with the the constraints coming from canonical general relativity. I can, you can write you write them in Hamiltonian form in terms of you solve some of them. Then you change your solution from being real to complex in order to to simplify the analysis. You add a parameter which I never understood this Emirzi parameter. And then they and then they. 
and, and then they have these um, diagrams, which they call spin foam, which, okay, essentially trying to solve, I think we'll do it to something else. That's trying to solve, uh, okay, the, so I think I'm with George on that. I think it's a different, I think it's a different quantum mechanical system. But the quantum mechanics doesn't have a space. There's no, the, the fields don't depend on X. So X somehow becomes some emergent thing. It's not obviously wrong, but both of these cases, they suffer from the problem. They can't show that they reproduce general relativity. So in the classical limit, where you're supposed to get general relativity, they can't show that. So I think if they could show it, I think th they would get much more attention than they do. But, um, but at the moment, it's an exercise. Well, this is the triangulation is more a, s a simulation game where you try to see what you get. Although there are mathematicians working on it too. That, um, but the loop quantum gravity for me, I think, it's too far for me from general relativity to convince me that it's on the right track. But again, there are groups working on this. So those are the, and then the string theory. Okay, so, so string theory is somewhat uh, related to this higher derivative gravity, but, but the difference is that you start with general relativity and you add other fields. And the other fields are massive, massless, but ordinary, well, in this case, it would be four-dimensional fields. But you add them in a certain way, which is not ad hoc in the sense that it's not by hand. It comes out of quantization of a string. So add ma massless and massive fields. Which come out of quantization of a string. So, so how does that help? So in these diagrams, I assumed that you only have gravitons circling in the loops. Of course, it's possible that there are other contributions to this. Coming from other particles. in such a way that you get cancellation. Okay, so, so this is not the way string theory was constructed, but it turns out that's what it does. So it essentially in introduces other particles circling in these loops, which cancel the divergence. So that you can make sense out of the perturbation theory. So, of course, making sense out of perturbation theory doesn't mean you understand quantum gravity, but at least it means you understand perturbative quantum gravity, or how to, how to resolve the problem of this quantum gravity. Okay, so um, the other thing that I mentioned is um, this is very distant from experiments, so um, I think everybody knows that, but um, just to make it clear how distant. So, it, yes, so these are ordinary particles. There's nothing funny about these particles in the sense that um, you, it turns out you have to add an infinite number of them, so that we might say is funny. But most of them are very massive, so you wouldn't see them in experiments. So, but they're ordinary particles. I don't know if that answered your question. Thank you. So, that's right. That's right. Okay. So, right. So, so what's the th what's the energy at which you'll see them? So that's what I'm about to say. So. You can, of course, write g in different units. So using h bar and c, there's something called Planck length. So I guess I said g has units of length squared. So it has to have units of square root of g times factors of h bar and c in order to make it have units of length. And this is like a, um, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. So the length scale at which quantum gravity effects become relevant are at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. If you translate this into energies, so if you do 1 over square root of g, then it, of course, has units of energy. And that goes like 10 to the 19 GV. Okay. So, 
So these are, this has nothing to do with string theory. This is just the scales at which quantum gravity becomes relevant. So you can take two attitudes. You can say, who cares, right? I don't, I don't want to know about this theory because I'm never, at least certainly in my lifetime, going to have any evidence for this. Um, but another approach is to say, okay, possibly by studying this theory, so some people, I don't know if George is one of them or not, but um, say it's not even clear that there is a graviton. A graviton would be a unit of uh, minimum energy, which is in a gravitational wave. So, for example, we, we, I think we all believe electromagnetic waves are made out of photons, which have a minimum energy. Some people might say, no, it's not even clear that classical gravity has to have a graviton. Maybe it's just quantum mechanics is irrelevant when general relativity comes into play. So that's a possibility. Okay, but, but is it an open question for you? Okay, I do too. Yeah, I do. So, um, so but there's an argument, and there are people doing tests, and uh, I think using quantum optics, to see if, if there really is some kind of evidence for a graviton existing. There are no experiments yet with positive results, but the people designing experiments to to try to find some kind of interference between gravitons or things like that. So that would be what you need. You need some kind of quantum effect involving gravitation. So, so of course, there's another topic which is, of course, related to this, but not equivalent, which is quantum field theory and curved spacetime. Okay, so that's certainly George's involved and people are involved in. That, you don't need the graviton to do that. You just, okay, that's quantum mechanics and curved space. I don't think anybody denies that we need to quantize in curved spacetime. But there is a question if, okay, so in any case, if you believe that there's a graviton, then at some point a theorist has to say, well, what theory describes this? Okay, and um, hopefully the theory will be interesting enough that eventually you'll be able to test it. Interesting enough means it has some predictions that you'll be able to test. Um, but again, it's not, it's not obvious. Um, but certainly string theory um, is an example of a theory in which, in principle, you could test it. But you would need these energies or length scales in order to make an unambiguous test. Unambiguous means you'd be able to see these extra particles. Okay. So when is this energy available? Well, inflation or black holes. Right? Um, so we don't, well, because we know that black holes exist. We think inflation existed, but we certainly don't have experiments that can test these energy scales yet. So how, how do you intend to, to test it with black holes? Um, maybe, OK. I don't know, but suppose, suppose you could build a, a gravity wave detector, which was so precise that it could say, you know, what happened when, when the black hole collides or you know, when, the, when the energy scales are very, very large. I think evaporation of black holes, probably you know better than me, that's hopeless. Yeah, yeah, that's hopeless. And, and also in gravitational fields, you, in order to detect, you know, wavelengths small like this, you have to have, I think that's as, as difficult as, as producing, you know, a collider. I, I'm with you. Okay. <laughs> I'm not arguing. I, I think... Maybe in our lifetime we'll see evidence of quantum gravity. For example, interference of, of gravitons or something like that. But I agree with you. Um, seeing these energy scales or these lengths, I agree with you. That that's at least, okay. I don't have any good ideas anyway. But, of course, the hope is... So let me give you an example of what might come out of something like string theory, just before I spend another half an hour telling you about string theory. So, for example, string theory is natural to describe in space-times which have more than four dimensions. If our space-time has more than four dimensions, I think there's a reasonable chance, if the dimension is not too small, that we'll be able to see it. So, for example, this doesn't have to be at... Of course, if the 
If the dimension of the, if the length of the extra dimensions is this length scale, then it's hopeless. But it might be there are people doing experiments now, testing if, for example, the gravitational force doesn't go like 1 over d squared. So this coefficient here changes if you change the number of dimensions. So there are experiments going on that might detect something. Um, so I think now they've shown that up to, I think, one, I don't know if it's an angstrom, but maybe it's 100 angstroms that there doesn't exist any extra dimensions. But maybe at one angstrom, maybe there exists an extra dimension. I mean, it's not, it's not ruled out, that's all I can say. It, it's not a prediction of string theory, just like it's, uh, well, it is a prediction of, um, how do I say, not a, pr prediction is not the right word. It's evidence for string theory. Well, look, let, okay, so let, let me say a few things about string theory before we say what are the predictions. So, okay, so, so I mentioned to you that string theory naturally has extra dimensions. So if you see extra dimensions, there's another thing it naturally has, which is space-time supersymmetry. So there are two properties of string theory, which, of course, are properties of other theories also. So it doesn't, uh, it, doesn't um, it rules out some theories if you see space-time supersymmetry. If you see extra dimension, it rules out some theories. It certainly doesn't rule out string theory. And I would say so string theory is the, is the first example of a theory which has supersymmetry. It's certainly not the first example which has extra dimensions. But it's the first theory that I know that requires extra dimensions. So in that sense, uh, so these are properties which have not yet been seen, but, but might be seen in the future. Now, um, as Roger, you said correctly, we don't know at what energy scale, we'll see them. No, how, are you asking me, why do I work on string theory? Okay, no, so that's a good question. So, so this is a problem not for me, this is a problem not for you, it's a problem for the whole world, that we have had no new results in elementary particle physics for 50 years. So most of this community comes from elementary particle physics. So, of course, in cosmology we have had new results, I don't think we've had any new theories in cosmology. Uh, so we have lots of theories in particle physics, but we have no new results. So, of course, if you see this or you see this, that would be great. If you see something else, that would also be great. So if we saw something that was not this, everybody would do whatever they saw. So it's not the question of how long am I willing to wait. It's as soon as you tell me something new, I'm going to jump on it, just like everybody's going to jump on it. The mass of neutrinos doesn't fit your view? Um, no, because, um, because there's, there's why, why doesn't everybody jump on massive neutrinos? So I think the one reason, again, I don't work on massive neutrinos, but first of all, we don't really understand why the neutrino is massive. Um, if, there was an, if there was a theory that predicted that the, the neutrino had to be massive, I think people would would jump on it. But most people say, no, it's just a parameter you add to the standard model without really modifying the theory. So it wasn't needed for extra symmetries. It wasn't needed for any reason. It was just seen in an experiment and, and was messy, right? We don't even know what the masses are. Um, it is forbidden from the standard model. Right. Uh, result in, in particle physics, right? That's recent. Yeah. Kind of. No, I agree, but it's not the result that... Um, okay, I, I ask the same question when people say that, but um, okay, I don't have a good... If there was a good theory... Uh, does not demand that we increase nor decrease the symmetries we are assuming for the standard model. So it changes nothing in terms of symmetry being zero or not, right? And then, then that's, that's why it's not new in the sense that it doesn't change our assumptions about nature, yeah, how me, to build. Let me say it in my way, which is, I think is related. So there are two ways to, 
to find a theory. You can either start with some principle and see what the principle implies, or you can just keep adding stones one after the other just to match the experiment. So I think mass and neutrino people interpret it like that. It doesn't tell you anything new about the theory. It's just one more, one more stone you add, which makes the, the whole structure a little bit less stable. But it certainly doesn't kill anything that you knew before. As you said, it doesn't really change any of the symmetries. It's not, it's not a new ingredient. If it was a new particle, maybe that would, that would help. So then you could say, well, this particle comes from some additional symmetry that we didn't. But Which would be the case if we knew they are Dirac, Dirac yeah. uh, fermions, but we and don't maybe, know that. Yeah, yeah then, then, then maybe, yeah, then you get this. Uh, there might be some new physics there, but OK, it's unrelated to quantum gravity anyway. So I can <laughs> OK, but anyways, that's the problem we're all in for 50 years, is looking for some, some new ingredient. And string theory has these new ingredients, but we haven't seen them yet. OK, so um, okay, so I can say a little bit about string theory because people don't know anything. So the idea is you start with the generalization of the particle actions. So the particle action is usually written something like this, right? So dot means dd tau, and m is the mass. You can write this in first order form. Is something like this. And then you integrate out E and you get this. Of course, you can also just set M equals zero and then you drop this. So this is in some sense more general than this. For the string, instead of just integrating over time or world line, now you integrate over both a world line direction and a an extra parameter, which is why you call it a string. So this would be the closed string. So the action is not so different. You have a, here you get, um, well, I'm not going to write it all down, but you get something like determinant of, so it's a two by two matrix. You can do determinant. Another way to write it is in this way. So it's the analog of this. This is like a one-dimensional Vierbein. Now you have a two-dimensional metric. So this is the analog of this. But the difference between the two actions is that this action is not conformally invariant in one dimension. So there's a just because E, if you rescale it, the action doesn't stay invariant. So it's clearly not conformally invariant. Here, if you rescale H, because you have an H divided by the determinant of H, the square root of the determinant of H, in, it, the, the, the scale factor cancels. So this is called the two-dimensional conformally invariant theory, because it doesn't depend on the scale of H. So of course, it's not, it, it has masses, but the masses are 10-dimensional, 26-dimensional masses. The two-dimensional parameters essentially have no dimension. T is the analog of M, but it's called tension. So a string, of course, has tension. So there's a mass density, but it doesn't have a mass. The mass depends on the length. OK, so the point is that this theory is conformally invariant in two dimensions. We know how to quantize it. Now, the interesting thing is it's, it's easy to couple this to, to a metric. So I just add a term, GMN. X, I could have done the same thing here. So here, actually, it's GMN, XM dot, or D tau. So this is the action for a particle in a gravitational field, right? This is the action for a string in a gravitational field. The difference is that, remember, this action was conformally invariant. Now, if you quantize this action, before it was quadratic in x, now it's nonlinear in x, you find that it's not automatically conformally invariant. So first of all, you find it's conformally invariant at the quantum level. First of all, if d equals 26, so that means m goes from 0 to 25. So that's the first thing you see. So you see that already if you write the metric, if you put it in a flat background. 
So that, that's this thing that I told you that it requires extra dimension. But you also find that this is only conformally invariant if the, if the metric here satisfies an equation. And the equation is Rmn is equal to, well, it's like 0 equals Rmn plus, and then you get factors like t times r squared, t squared times r to the 4. So you get, uh, you get the equation in the limit in which, sorry, it's 1 over t, right? Um, yeah, it's 1 over t, sorry. In the limit where the tension goes to infinity, you get Einstein's equation. So the theory is only conformally invariant in the limit when t goes to infinity if GMN happens to satisfy Einstein's equation. So you could have said, well, what does this theory have anything to do with gravity? And you immediately see that if you couple it to gravity and you ask the theory is conformally invariant, you get something like Einstein's equation. So these are corrections to Einstein's equations, which are, come from essentially the massive fields that I told you about before. Okay. So that's the easiest way to see that this theory is related to general relativity. In fact, when people started studying this theory, they had no idea they were studying quantum gravity. They were just studying this string theory, which they thought had something to do with the strong interactions. Okay, so that's um, a surprise, but it's an interesting surprise. Yeah? Uh, what are the indices of the string and what are the indices of the space-time? So i and j are 1 and 2. So that's the, I should have written this as d tau 1, d tau 2. So i and j are the two-dimensional metric, mm -hmm. and m and n from the two-dimensional point of view, they're just labels. But if from the space-time point of view, they're the indices of the space-time. So m and n go from 0 to d minus 1. So gmn is the space-time metric, whereas hij is the world sheet metric. So this is a function of tau and say, or the tau. And when you say quantize it, what do you mean by quantizing it? What are Good. the degrees of freedom? Yeah. So you have, so let's do this case first. So you have x, and then you define the derivative with respect to x dot as being the canonical momentum. So we can do this for the particle, and we find that the canonical momentum has to satisfy p squared equals m squared, right, if we do the, the mass increase. We do the same thing here. We have xm. Now it's a function of both tau and sigma. So DL. And you find that when you quantize, you find that P and X satisfy the following constraint. PM DX M D sigma equals zero. And you also get P squared, but it's not the constant anymore. It depends on how the string is vibrating. So you get this kind of equation. So that means the mass squared of the string of the particle, which is the vibration of the string, depends on how the string is vibrating, which is not surprising. But now when you quantize, you have to normal order these. So when you normal order, you find that, um, that the, the mass squared, for example, when it's not vibrating at all, is not zero. So it turns out that this string theory gives you the mass squared. Uh, if you look at the, the fundamentals of the string, you find that the lowest particle has mass squared negative, so something like minus. Um, minus t. And then you'll also get particles p squared equals 0. And then you get various multiples of t. So you get, you get the whole tower of particles. And these correspond to the vibrations of the string. So you'll get the string vibrating like this, the string vibrating like this, etc. So, so that's what you're quantizing. Quantizing the, the variables x and p in the action. Okay, so you tachyon. It means that the theory that we're describing here is sick, so we have to introduce supersymmetry. So this is what's called bosonic string. It is junk in the sense that nobody studies it anymore as a fundamental theory. I don't know. Sorry. So junk is, I don't know how you use the word junk. No, a mathematician would say that junk is something that is inconsistent, right? not something that's not observable. So a mathematician would say this is junk because it has a tachyon. 
or mathematical physicist would say is chunky because it has a tech. You know. But um, but it turns out so this was developed early 70s to describe strong interactions. It has some nice properties, but it has this property which made people throw it away. So there was found another string theory which they didn't throw away because it didn't have this property. So this is called the superstring. So, um, that's, well, okay, so it depends on which, so if we're doing the closed string, then what you get at low energies is you get, that's correct, you don't you just get, you get, a scalar particle, a graviton, and you also get an anti-symmetric field, which you could call an axion if you want in four dimensions. So, um, so it has, I mean, how can I say? The fact that it has a tachyon made people throw it away because people have a theory with tachyons. It means the vacuum is unstable. So, so the way you you get rid of the tachyon is you add some anti-commuting variables to this action. So if you do that here, just to tell you what that looks like, because people aren't familiar with this, it turns out this action here, although probably people haven't seen it as much as they've seen the other one, turns out to describe a spin one-half particle, where the spin is constructed out of the size. So it, although it, you would imagine that it describes a boson, it actually describes a fermion. When you do this in the string theory, it describes a whole tower of bosons and a whole tower of fermions. And the way it does it is it does it in a way in which there's a symmetry that relates the bosons and fermions. So, so these are the bosons, and then the fermions, you would get things like, I mean, I'll write different letters. So this would be the analog of a uh, Fotino. And this would be the analog of a gravitino. So it's a supersymmetric version of gravity, which, as he mentioned, contains not just the graviton, it contains other fields, and it also contains these fermions. So this is called supergravity. So in the same sense that string theory predicts these extra dimensions, the consistency of the theory also predicts that you, you'll have space-time supersymmetry, which we, of course, know is not property of our universe, but it might be broken. And the question is, at what energy scale is it broken? So, so again, if you see supersymmetry in an experiment, it doesn't mean that string theory is correct, but it's evidence for string theory. So the other way around, of course. So as I, as I said, if, if, if there was something that they found, finding the Higgs is useless, right? Because the Higgs is 50 years old, the theory. You have to find something else. No. Yeah, 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 but I mean for new theories, it's for going beyond the standard model. So I agree with George. I think massive neutrinos is the only hint we have. Maybe dark matter, but until we see what dark matter is, it doesn't help much. Um, so in any case, so that's the situation we're in now, is that we're, we hope to see something new in experiments. We haven't seen it yet. There's another property of string theory I'll just say in five minutes, which is uh, duality. So. So all of this is um, related to particle physics, but there are other properties of the theory which are very interesting, and um, although they've been discovered in string theory, maybe they will, they certainly have had applications in other areas. So the simplest example of the duality is something called T-duality, which is actually easy to explain. So if you have a theory which you compactify in a circle of radius r, then I think people have heard the terms kutze klein field. So the point is that the field can have, so let's say one of the dimensions is compactified. What that means is that when you go around the circle, so you have to have phi of x is equal to phi of x plus 2 pi r in this direction. So let's say this is x, it's one of the directions, let's call it the fifth direction just to, What that means is that it can only go like e to the i n over r in that direction, right? Where n is an integer. 
What that means is that the mass, if you measure the mass of this particle in four dimensions, it's going to contain an extra factor. So the, the mass in four dimensions is going to have a factor from here, which is n over r squared. So if it started as a massless particle, if there, were no, there was no dependence on this fifth direction, then you would get the whole tower of states if one of the dimensions is compactified, which, and the tower would go like n over r squared, where n is an integer. So people are looking for these states in LHC. Of course, they haven't seen them. But uh, this is a feature of um, particle theories, which are not string theories, in the sense that the, the, the Kaluza-Klein tower, as r goes to infinity, of course, these things go away. And they become important when r goes to 0. Now, in string theory, there's another thing you can do, which is the string could wind around the extra dimension. So it's a new kind of, uh, it's a new kind of excitation when you, have, when you have a compactified direction that a closed string could wind. It could wind around once, or it could wind around twice. It could wind around m times. Okay. Now, the energy or the mass squared of the string depends not just on this momentum here, but it's also going to depend on, remember, you have this term here. So it's going to depend on how many, how many times it winds around. So what you find is that, and, it's, and the, the constant here is proportional to the tension. If the tension is very... Um, is very large, then it doesn't like to wind around. So let's see. So it's going to be something like T times M over M times R. So the point is that um, if it winds around many times, then the contribution from the tension is going to increase. And now if R gets bigger, it's going to have a bigger effect and not a smaller effect. So you find that the spectrum that you would see in an experiment, it doesn't, it doesn't um, go away if R goes to infinity. In fact, there's a duality, which is if you take R to, uh, I guess it's, um, I'm trying to get the right factors. So let's see, so just take 1 over R to RT and you take m to n, the theory stays the same. So it means there's a duality between compactifying on a small circle and compactifying on a large circle. Okay, so this is called t-duality. So the theory is the same. All of the experiments you do in a space-time which has a very small compactification radius or very large will give the same results. So that's something, of course, that's not true of ordinary particle theories. Um, and it has, it has effects on cosmology. So if you consider cosmology where you compactify one of the dimensions. So this has obviously was found in string theory. People use this now to study, uh, mathematicians use this to study geometry of, uh, so this is compactification on a circle. You can also study on more complicated surfaces. Uh, this type of t-duality ex was later extended to non-perturbative duality. So here, we don't discuss the coupling constant. It turns out there are also dualities that relate a theory compactified on a, on a, on a um, geometry of radius r with another theory with a coupling constant related to r. So that's this ADS-CFT correspondence. And I don't have time to discuss, but, but it relates the coupling constant in a theory, in a field theory, with the radius of compactification of another theory. Okay, so. So all of these dualities have had impact not just in um, string theory, but for other, for other types of, um, I'm not going to describe all the applications of these, but it's an application of string theory which is not directly related to quantum gravity, but it's had an impact on other fields. So um, that's one way, well, he was asking why I work on string theory if I don't expect uh, to see experimental results. So there are other, um, applications of the theory which are not related to, to specifically quantum gravity, which I think are interesting and, and have had impact. Um, okay, so I'll stop here, I think, for questions.
So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Nathan because this is uh, at least in my mind, this is the kind of, uh, of uh, colloquium that would fit perfectly these challenges in great okay. areas in Good. physics. So thank you very much for your effort. Uh, questions? Of course, we didn't have time to approach the subject, but there are ampl amplitude relations between open strings and closed strings, which are very important, yeah. especially nowadays. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, okay, so part of this duality you can interpret just to, so ADS is anti deciduous space, and that's certainly related to the closed string side, which is related to gravity. This CFT is, stands for conformal field theory, but not conformal field theory in two dimensions, in four dimensions, which is a gauge theory, which is related to the open string sector. So this is very closely related to closed open duality. So, um, yeah, as he mentioned, there are applications of string theory. You're just studying amplitudes, which have been, which have been useful. And that's an example. Questions? I have a question. Can you devise any experiment that can falsify string theory? Yes. So it's kind? easy to falsify. It's easy what? to falsify. The easiest way to falsify is find special relativity is wrong, quantum mechanics is wrong. <laughs> that falsifies not just quantum everything. mechanics, it this also falsifies, falsifies everything, right? No, no. So, no. yeah. Um, well, if you say that the special relativity is wrong, you're, you're saying example, that the space time over which every theory that we know is built on is wrong. Yes, but for example, people, you know, you know this result about testing that the, that the velocity of light is the same as the velocity of a gravity wave. If that had given different answers, you could throw away string theory. Everything. You no, can no, 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 no. There were some people who were saying from loop quantum gravity that they would measure different velocities. They say that... Some people. There were some people from loop quantum gravity, they were arguing, no, they're different, and, and this will prove that loop quantum gravity is correct. But, uh, no, what I mean is, do you know... Uh, do, do you devise any experiment that would rule out string theory, yes. but not all physics altogether, <laughs> like <laughs> quantum mechanics and special relativity and all these things? Um, no, um, at the moment? No, no. In principle. Ah, no, no. In principle, yes. So, in, in, as she said, I mean, if we can get to these energy scales, then we can rule out string theory. No, but not that in principle. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit less in principle. <laughs> no. So no, no, I agree. No. If you, you, I agree. But you mean you said something about inflation, for example. Uh, tell me a theory. Tell me an experiment which will rule out inflation. Well, <laughs> that's that's with you, not with me. <laughs> I mean, a better theory would rule. Right? If somebody has a better explanation, the same with string theory. If somebody could explain quantum gravity in a better way, or I mean, string theory is um, how do I say? It? We're doing it because there's nothing better in town. If there was something better, at least I think there's nothing better. Some other people think there are things. Yeah, better. there's nothing, uh, nothing better to to resolve quantum gravity. But you know, sometimes it's the best thing to do is to wait, work on something else. And then on, tell me just what go else back. to work on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I mean, everybody no, I, makes I see, choices. I see your point. Yeah, everybody makes choices. So I'm not sure if there was a student today asking, what do I want to work in? I would probably say, go work in neurobiology or something like that, because that's where things are happening, right? But, but some people say, no, I want to work on the universe because, you know, that's what I want to work on. Okay. <laughs> I see. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that that's a good question. What are the uh, latest developments in oh, string okay. theory so, in the last ten years? Okay. That so we there were no revolution. So again, personal view, a personal view. Fifty. No, I'm, I'm a personal view. 10. Okay. So let's 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 go through this. Okay. So <laughs> yeah, personal view. Yeah. So personal yeah. view. Okay. So space time supersymmetry for me is something important. Oh, that's old. I mean, this. No, is no. He said fifty years. I said ten. <laughs> okay. No, ten years. No, I would say I. Personal view. <laughs> personal view. In the it, personal view. Yeah. Nothing. Nah. Personal view, no revolutionary statements have been come out after. Um, no, no, nothing is, is too strong. For example, my papers came out after this. Right? So that's <laughs> <laughs> but, but no revolution, so if that's what you're asking. No. But I could ask the same question about hundreds of, of other fields. Yes. 
Yeah, there's a... You said that there are many, uh, let's say, uh, good theoretical reasons to say that gravity should be quantized. And I remember a couple of, but I don't remember anymore. I remember that ah, okay. I heard so sometimes. Gravity, of course, couples to electromagnetism, right? Mm -hmm. It's very hard to write a theory which has part of the theory being quantum and the other mm -hmm. not, because they interact. So how right. do you, so of course you can throw away quantum mechanics and say, okay, we have to start from scratch. But I think if you want to say that a theory is quantum and it interacts with gravity, I think you have I, I don't know how to avoid quantizing gravity. Mm -hmm. So that's the theory. So that's more or less, more or less the question I, I was going to make. Um, uh, where we expect discrepancies uh, from assuming gravity is quantized and gravity is not quantized, given it interacts with... I'm sorry, why, are you asking why people study it? Or are you no, 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 I mean, uh, where we expect, like, um, at which scale uh, for I'm sorry, are you asking me if we need to quantize gravity, or are you asking me um, where it breaks down? Where what breaks it, wh down? Where it breaks down. Where, where is the where difference? Where classical gravity breaks down? No, uh, for assuming, for instance, gravity is quantized, Yes. Um, then uh, where like where we expect to see difference from being quantized and non-quantized. Unfortunately, at that energy scale. Only at that scale. No, you might, no, as I said, um, we, that's we, the energy we, scale at which it's manifest. Yeah. But you might, for example, see interference effect. Okay. Also the experiments. Yeah, the experiments, you, 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 you talked about the experiments. So I, I am I not a quantum optics person. Okay. But there, We're having a workshop on this, unfortunately, or fortunately, in September, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gabriel was on a Zoom call today, so. I don't think the experiment's been done. Okay. 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 What Gabriel is saying, just a comment. What Gabriel is saying is that if you can entangle uh, pairs of particles using gravity, yes. uh, this implies that gravity is quantum. You I cannot it do does. it without, without uh, considering a, a classical field theory for gravity. I think it does, but do you agree, George? Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So do you know what happens if you try to generalize the string to the membrane or when you try to quantize it? Okay, so what goes wrong, you mean? So yeah, yeah. the problem is that um, okay, so you could ask the question if you try to hit the drum and you can ask why can't I hear different notes when I hit a drum? So it's just that the spectrum is not linear anymore. You get the, because it's a, you get three X's here, right? So it, it, it's just a, a, a you, you get the nonlinear equations of motion. So you don't get a spectrum of states, you get a continuum of states. So it's not a discrete spectrum, it's a continuous spectrum. And people don't, I mean, you can try to quantize, but it's a mess. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. But yeah, I think if this goes wrong in some obvious way, it, it's well, inconsistent. Well, the obvious thing that goes wrong is that you don't get a discrete spectrum. You get a continuum. So some people try to interpret it like bound states, which I think is natural. So then this would imply that you have to see particles of very small mass then in this case. I'm sorry, so they're bound states. I didn't understand oh, what you okay. said about small mass. So, so you, you said that a continuous spectrum? You yeah, you can get a continuous spectrum if you have bound states, because then you have, I mean, it's... Okay, okay I see. Any other yeah. But are there people looking for uh, signatures of a string theory in, in uh, black hole Mars, I mean, in looking for gravitational wave, theory. but in gravitational waves uh, for black hole, when it still seems to me that maybe the way that this the is the is only yes. way to say it. I mean, no, even no, if it's no, no, you ask the hard. question in a way that it, the answer is yes for any question you're asking that way, because there are always people looking for. Signature. Is it serious? <laughs> I mean, it makes sense. <laughs> but. Is it serious? Does it make sense what people are doing? To me, it's your it would be like Roger you said. It's. Uh, there, there might be some signals, that, but it's certainly not direct evidence. So, for example, people say some kinds of inflation are related to string theory, right? And looking for, for those kinds of inflation, or some kinds of, for example, extensions of the standard model are related to string theory. Mm -hmm. So they say the words, but um, 
I think most string theorists, uh, again, it depends who you ask, are very skeptical. Okay. Okay. That's that's what I wanted to so to I could, hear. Yeah. Uh, but while you're giving him the mic, let me just give you an example. This is a serious physicist who I've collaborated with. He's at Harvard. He's a full professor. Uh, so Kumran Vafa. So he has an idea that dark matter is essentially these Kaluza Klein particles. It's it. it the, the evidence that he wants to show, so his claim is that at some scale, these gravitational detector experiments that I said, modifications of Newton's, of Newton's law, will detect an extra dimension, and he has a scale at which that will happen, in which will explain dark matter. So it, it's a, so he's looking for a signal. Yeah. Okay, maybe dark energy. I, so his thing is dark matter. So it's. It's, okay. it's, I think he says in five years they should be able to test it. And okay. But from yeah. what George said, this is very unlikely to be well, observed it's in It's very in, unlikely in, that the detector experiment... So, two things. It's unlikely that the detector experiment will see a deviation, but it's possible. And then you have to extrapolate from that to saying that it's dark matter, yeah. which is possible. So, but it's a prediction. So it's a signal and a prediction, which may be correct, may not be, but... So just to add a comment to what George was talking about, the precision in LIGO, um, I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was a Freeman Dyson that calculated the energy um, uh, 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 experiment to detect one uh, uh, graviton in an interferometer, interferometer uh, setup. And I think the uh, s experiment must be so massive, it's the size of its Schwarzschild radius, so it collapses into a black hole. I believe. So, yeah, uh, just to add a comment. Okay. Right? Yeah, but the common vapor is serious. I mean, if they see something, great. <laughs> Other questions? So let's thank again uh, Nathan and all of you for your questions. <laughs> <laughs>